we are ready to proceed. Uh, oh, I didn't want my glasses on, did I? Hello and thank you for watching. My name's Kurt Johnson and my field of expertise is social organization physics. On Saturday, November 24th, I'll make a presentation to the College of Complexes at which I'll describe a process to solve our problems in our electoral system. You know, the problems that keep us from holding a fair and honest public debate on the issues, followed by fair and honest elections, followed by a fair and honest government that addresses the issues debated. We can make those problems vanish. I intend to run a thought experiment to demonstrate it's physically possible to build a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, one with the potential to sustain for centuries without breaking down into a state of war, a government where those who are granted the opportunity to represent their community will only act in the best interests of those they were chosen to represent. A government where all have the equal opportunity to be heard. One that always works in the best interest of its entire population. Not a minority, but all. And a strange thing will prove true is, no matter whom we choose to represent us, the outcome will always be the same. An honest and beneficial government of a community of peers or equals. We can give up this quest to find a great leader. We don't need to find one. Sound preposterous? Yes siree. Honest government's another one of those nice ideas that ain't never going to happen like flying, solving the problem of smallpox or polio, heart transplants, in vitro fertilization, or being able to talk to anyone in the world in real time. Everyone knows democracy. The kind of government we now have is the least worst government ever known. That translates as a government that truly sucks, but the best we can hope for. So love it or leave it. I'm afraid that marriage of concession and intimidation has <clears throat> given birth to an apathy that prevents us from going in search of the best damn government human beings could ever hope to create. Not the least lousy, but the best of the best. The government approaching perfection. The one as elegant as the universe in which it and we exist. We can build it. It's not physically impossible for all who live under a government to experience their inherent rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The thought experiment will suggest it is possible if we're willing to work at it the way we worked at building our railways and spacecraft and computers. Now a thought experiment is an ingenious little device used as long as human beings have been exploring the physical potential of our world. And they became more widely known after they were formalized by Albert Einstein and used extensively to establish the ways and structure of the world of small quantum particles before we had the ability to see that world. The thought experiment is used to test proposals when there are physical limitations that prevent us from running an experiment in the real world. We have such a physical limitation before us. There is no way our current procedures will be set aside in 2016 and my proposed system utilized to prove its potential or even prove it, the idea, as ludicrous as one like say the earth is not the center of the universe. But we do have the ability to explore the potential by thinking through the experiment. It's the old what if. Now legitimate thought experiments are not mental free-for-alls where anything goes and anything can happen. It is not a case of if you can fantasize it, we'll pretend it will happen in the real world. Thought experiments must be conducted as rigidly as any other scientific experiment. The proposition must be set down, 
the experiment must be one that tests the proposition, and once set in motion, the experiment must be allowed to run to its natural and physical conclusion. There are two constraints of valid thought experiments. One is, anything that behaves in the mental experiment must be allowed to behave as it can and only as it can in the physical world. A second constraint, which may not be as intuitive as one might think is the physically possible, is admitted and permitted. It is, after all, a non-threatening thought experiment. Nothing can happen in this process alone to change your physical experience any more than watching a horror movie can put you in danger of being mauled by a chainsaw. So here's the setup. I've made two earlier presentations to the college. In the first I proposed there are three laws of physics pertinent to successful social systems. They are one, design exists in advance of and independent of organization and execution of design. Two, opportunity is afforded on the basis of self-selection. And three, potential conflicts and self-selection are resolved through chaotic process. In the second presentation, I propose there are inherent physical characteristics universal to human beings which are directly relevant to our social experience and that these drive our behaviors. We must build a social system which respects these characteristics or it will fail. I propose that all human beings are self-willed, self-interested, strictly rational and cannot be irrational, born with an incomplete brain that forms based on the, what presents itself in the immediate external environment, do not develop a mature brain until late 20s, modify our experience and change the world around us through a process that can be described as observe and observe, infer, and devise, have an inherent physical purpose to organize matter, cannot do anything at any time that is not actually fulfilling that purpose, and every capacity of the human brain is essential to the conduct of human purpose, and that is why we have these capacities. In this mental experiment, I will begin with the structure of our current processes for choosing those who will, who, those who will occupy offices and positions. Examine those processes through a knowledge of successful social systems. Identify the faults in process that do not square with the laws of social organization. Modify those processes so that their structure does conform to law and follow out the implications. I'll build on my earlier work in a way you will be able to test. Now here's what I won't do. I won't propose I can solve your problems if you make me king and let me order people around and impose my will on everyone and make others carry out my big ideas. I'm a human being and I'm well aware. If you make me king of the world, first thing I'll do is take it home, park it in my garage, and charge you admission to visit. Oh, I'll be benevolent. I'll be kind to babies. Children under two will be admitted free when accompanied by a paying adult. I don't want a job in government. I just want the honest government of peers that is my inherent right. I'm not going to tell anyone how to believe, how to think, how to feel. I'm not going to decide what issues should be tackled or decisions should be made by any elected person or any governing body. Nor will I set policy or ideology to guide them other than remind them the keys to social success or the laws of social organization and the laws of physics as a whole. But I will influence how they believe, think, feel, and even act by the structures I create. Still, I'll be more than happy to let those who come into positions of office do the job 
to which they were elected, free of any puppet mastering on my part. Let's change the subject. I want to touch on what I perceive to be the potential behind this experiment. If I'm able to describe a process which can be observed to be physically doable, not easy but physically possible, and it appears to bring about a predicted and desired change of experience, a change that's been long sought but never reached, and I reference those changes to the laws I claim exist I've now laid the groundwork for anyone up to the challenge to test the laws of social organization physics by the very same process all other laws of physics have been tested. If I'm as wrong about these laws or most, as most are convinced, it should be a job done in four minutes. But let's assume for a minute that the experiment passes muster that it appears it could be possible for us to build the government of our dreams. I didn't say easy, only possible. It will be the first time in human history of which I'm aware physical evidence will suggest preferable human social experience becomes controllable and predictable, which is to say possible to cause to occur and sustain exactly as we build airplanes to fly where we want. Remember, we can't control our social outcome today. We want to live in peace, end poverty, stop wrongful incarceration, receive fair wages in a sound economy. We desire equal rights, equal opportunity, open government. We'd like a clean environment, and we can't have any of it. People may be rich as hell, but they don't live in a sound economy. They don't live with a fair government. They aren't secure in their houses without buying security. We all fear someone and we all live unnaturally precarious lives. We all live lives of abnormal stress. But if we could set up the cause and effect scheme that delivered these desired social outcomes predictably, it would be the first time in known human history we would truly be in control of our destiny. It would be the first time we could pull ourselves away from this path of self-destruction we follow against our will, where every promise to cooperate degenerates to war. It would be a thing so much bigger than discovering we could fly. Now I'll run this scenario, scenario as far as I'm able in one hour. I'm confident if you follow the experiment, then take up where I leave it off and challenge the experiment, staying true to the rigid required structure of thought experiments. You'll have opportunity to see each of these laws of physics and human traits become a self-evident truth. Or uh, you will bring to light the fault in my work and provide me information that drives me closer to my goal of government of, by, and for the people in a country where our inherent rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are no longer an inaccessible dream, but our daily experience. And I trust these are goals we share. I hope we can cooperate on this matter. Now I wish to talk more about the physics of social organization to better prepare you to understand the mechanics of the process I'll carry out next Saturday. There is a method to my madness. Specifically, I want to explore the physics of equality. Because if there's ever a government of, by, and for the people, it will prove to be a government of peers or equals in a society of equals. Now, I did not say equal experience or equal outcomes. But each citizen will have equal opportunity as any other citizen to share in the benefits, privileges, burden, and design of the government of the United States or the country they live in. Equal opportunity as good as we can get, and we need reach for no more. If we achieve that alone, we will achieve the rest quite naturally. But we must have a clear understanding of what constitutes equal opportunity and how one establishes and ensures equal opportunity. We have to see how that differs from our current experience. We have to see how it is possible 
to create equal opportunity, not worry about equal outcomes, and avoid unfair outcomes. So, first, I'll identify the condition that solves the problem. Next, I'll move to a brief discussion of physics, a general and accepted and otherwise. From there, I'll transition to observations of the social systems in general. And then I'll explore a system which I think will tie it all together. That system is the game of football. Now, when we contemplate social orders, we fixate on equality, which we interpret as fairness, and rightly so. But equality is a mathematical concept. And there are situations and events for which equality is impossible to establish. Now, we need not abandon equality. We need to keep it at hand and refer to it often. But we need to turn our attention to the phenomenon of equilibrium, which is not equality. Now, physics doesn't really deal with equality, though physicists constantly use the mathematical concept of equality in many ways, including establishing a condition of equilibrium. We can explore the characteristics of equi equilibrium in physics and social systems, and it's easier to show than tell, and that's why we'll play with football. In physics, a partial definition of equilibrium is a state where all the opposing forces cancel each other out, so there's no net change. Now, it is possible to have a system where the forces at work are extremely dynamic, resulting in great activity, but cancel each other out so completely. There is an ultimate state of no change. I propose until recently our climate and environment were each and collectively a system in equilibrium. To look around, there was much change afoot, day by day, season by season, year by year. Some of the forces were torrential, but beneath all that superficial change was a state of no change. We always returned to the same conditions in the same order of occurrence over and over again. Not exactly, but, you know, the same. Now, I'm not sure our climate is still in that state of equilibrium, although it will return to equilibrium. The climate will find equilibrium, but I won't guarantee it will be an equil equilibrium we will find as satisfying as it once was. Now, we can have directional equilibrium. This would be a system where the system is not returning to the same position we were once in, but the dynamic forces of the system cancel each other out only partially, and the uncanceled forces propel the system through states of change. And this is what happens when we walk. And this is what happens with an airplane. The system's always out of equilibrium, but in a controlled manner, such that it appears to be in equilibrium. A system expressing direct, directional e equilibrium is said to be under control if the equilibrium drives the system to a predicted and desired outcome. That's what we want in our social systems. We want dynamic directional systems where all manner of forces are playing at the same time, but all those forces cancel each other to drive the system in the direction we establish. We want social systems where there's liberty and justice and honest government, among other things. We want freedom, and yet we can't all be free to do exactly everything and anything we want to do at any time because we will encroach on other people's freedom. Well, let's talk about two points where I deviate from standard physics. A system, by my definition, 
is a collection of component parts organized against a common objective or purpose. The purpose of the components of a system is always to express a behavior that drives to the accomplishment of the system purpose. No field of science today has developed what it considers an adequate definition of system. Many fields of science define a system to be a collection of component parts and stop there and admit that it's incomplete. Now, the introduction of the purpose into the definition, the introduction of purpose into, defi into the definition solves the problem. But physicists refuse to accept purpose as a condition of physics. They refuse to accept it as either matter or energy, refuse to accept it exists because it cannot be verified mathematically. Well, I agree it doesn't pass those tests, but we can set up a test to show nothing in the world of physics, theoretical or practical, can be accomplished without leveraging purpose. If you can't build something without engaging purpose, and you're building a physical system, purpose then must be, must have a physical characteristic. And the experiment's very simple. Carry out any scientific experiment without engaging the phenomenon of purpose. To demonstrate, purpose is not a valid force. Hint. If you accept the challenge to even try, you have already failed. To say purpose can't be proven because we can't see it, it's very much like saying gravity doesn't exist because we can't see it. We don't learn how to measure anything except we admit it exists and ask how to measure it. There are many ways to measure the existence of purpose as a physical phenomenon. So you have the two differences. I accept purpose to be a principal force of physics, and I accept a system as a collection of components organized against a common purpose. I accept the purpose of a component part is always to drive to the purpose of the system. So now I can say systems in dynamic or directional equilibrium are ones in which all the forces are canceled except those which drive to the established purpose of the system. If you can walk where you want without falling or fly to the airport, you establish at the outside of your flight, you're in dynamic or directional equilibrium. Fair enough? When I'm working with the phenomenon of purpose, I may be working out the, outside the structure of the science of physics, but I'm very much on solid ground in the domain of physics, which the science only partially understands. And yes, I'm one of those who only partially understands, should the question arise. I'm actually an idiot savant in the world of physics, trust me. Do you remember my inherent traits of human beings? I included a human purpose to organize matter. I established that by the very same test biologists used to establish the purpose behavior of species. Because that test works, I accept its conclusions. I could do that because I accepted the universal nature of purpose and asked not if one existed, but how to find it. I followed accepted scientific process to reach my conclusion. Here's something I've observed, and you can look around today even as new social systems form and observe it yourself. Whether we're talking a nation, a tribe, a card club, a band of outlaws, a charity, a church, doesn't matter. All social systems organized by human beings have at their conception the specific purpose to organize in order to enable the population to cooperate in order to achieve collectively what no member of the popular community would be able to achieve individually. It is the pooling of skill applied to resources to attract benefits which no member alone would be able to accomplish. 
the agreement at inception is always mutual benefit, share and share alike, one for all and all for one. The agreement is always, we are equals in this together. Here are some things to notice. All social systems organize against the purpose. Now that purpose is always to organize matter in one way or another. Even if that is only to rob the bank and move the bank's money from the vault to a cellar, whereupon we'll use it to our benefit. What I'm saying is all human social systems at their inception are coherent relative to the species purpose and will never slip out of coherence with that species purpose. Bear with me on that. All social systems begin with a stated purpose and an agreement to work to mutual benefit. Even bank robbers agree to share and share alike. When that agreement breaks down and someone is cut out and someone else gets all the money, the system is technically no longer in directional equilibrium. It is, however, a system coherent with the inherent human purpose to organize matter. It's the exact same phenomenon as if you boarded a jet under an agreement to be taken to New York, but the pilot changes his mind and decides he would like to fly to Haiti. All the way to Haiti, the plane will conform with the laws of aerodynamics. What it won't conform to is the original directional purpose to which the laws of aerodynamics were employed. No individual joins a social system or a social movement or a revolution except they believe that joining will accord them benefit, fulfill their ambitions, and they will have equal rights as those held by other members of the same. They don't buy in except they are convinced they will have the same opportunity to succeed even though there may not be a guarantee of success. No one insists to be slaved, the impoverished, the one cheated out of their money. Everyone joins the movement of their choice in pursuit of the inherent human rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, however they define them. Every social system ever established by human beings began in equilibrium and with a purpose to cooperate to the end of receiving mutual benefit. And the method is always organized matter. I bring this up to point out the problem has never been the foundation. We begin with an agreement to cooperate to an end of mutual benefit. When we started, we were all equal. At least it was represented that case. The problem was we didn't establish and maintain a state of equilibrium that enabled us to achieve that directional equilibrium or drive our system along the purpose for which we built our system. We unleashed forces and we didn't cancel any out that could cause our system to veer ve off track. So the question is not how do we get to a state of equilibrium. That's easy. Cooperation is equal so the end of mutual benefit equals social equilibrium. And that is equilibrium at inception. That will always be equilibrium throughout the duration of our system's life. The real question is, once we fire this social system up as a dynamic, directional, and productive system, how do we cancel out forces to ensure that social system continues in a state of equilibrium along the path of our choosing? Not just flying, but going to our New York What do we have to do to maintain equilibrium? The short answer is we establish conditions that conform to the laws of social organization physics. And the longer answer is for every force at play in our social system, we must build the force that counters and cancels and keeps our system in directional equilibrium. Directional equilibrium established as a system driving to our original purpose. And there are forces in every system that are beyond our control, such as gravity, 
but we must still institute forces to counter the effects of such forces. The forces beyond our control in social systems which we cannot and should not aspire to quash and eliminate because they are essential to the, dis the success of our dynamic system are the inherent human traits I've identified. We are self-willed and self-interested and we cannot escape that and we don't want to because that's part of our genius. But still, forces must be employed that guarantee everyone's self-will and self-interest are defended. Not just the self-will and self-interest of a few. Because that is a condition that knocks our system out of directional equilibrium. We must employ the counterforces just as we employ forces to counter gravity in order to fly. And that means we build structures out of matter to accomplish our system purposes. We do not simply ask people to police themselves, act on their honor. We don't trust them any more than we trust gravity to back off enough to keep our airplane in flight. We secure the condition we desire. So let's play with the game of football to observe how much effort is invested in establishing and maintaining directional equilibrium to ensure this social system drives in the direction we established. Let me be clear here. I'm talking about the pure game of football. I'm not talking about the game in the context of children's high school collegiate or professional leagues. Those are failing social systems and that they do not accomplish their stated system's purposes. The game itself qualifies as a successful social system. Now to make my points I will refer to conditions of the game as it is played professionally. But in no way should that be taken as an endorsement of professional football as a valid model of successful social organization. Let's establish first that football is a system. Is it a collection of components that drive to an established system purpose? Well, I think so. The purpose is a game. The purpose of the game is to score. The players try to score. So, are the purposes of the elements of the system coherent with the system purpose? I think the answer is yes. By physical definition we have a system. Now let's establish it as a social system. We can ask and answer if this is a system composed of a population that has agreed to organize in a fashion that allows them to cooperate to the end of accomplishing what no individual may accomplish by themselves and to mutual benefit. I think it qualifies and it turns out it's a sustainable system. It can't be used up and human beings continue to employ it generation after generation and extract the benefits. It achieves today what it was designed to achieve at its outset. This is cool. You see, we have a specimen which we may study to see if it maintains directional equilibrium through the application of forces to cancel out other forces at play in the system. And if it does, we have the ability to ask how it accomplishes the same. Here's an overview of the game. Two teams of 11 players play the game at one time. Each team defends the goal at their back, which is to say they try to prevent the other team from advancing the ball across their goal line. Each team earns points by crossing the other team's goal line with the ball. If the ball is carried or caught behind the line, that is a touchdown and six points are awarded. If the team scores a touchdown, they then have an opportunity to earn extra points by either carrying or kicking the ball across the line. If a team is not able to advance the ball down the field to cross the opponent's goal line by run or pass, 
They may attempt to kick the ball across the goal between two uprights approximately 23 feet apart. That score is worth three points. And if a team, when defending their goal, does so well it actually stops the other team behind their own goal, it is awarded two points. And when points are awarded, the team holding the ball is required to kick the ball away to the other team. Think about this. If we don't mark those goal lines on the grass and set out those ball bound lines or set those scoring objectives and weight those objectives differently and divide up into two teams and make rules as to, as to who can do what we can do and what we can't do. What do we do? Just sit in the grass and wish there was something to do? By organizing a system of opportunities and limitations or challenges, we've just created a world where we can do so much. We can test our skills on so many levels. We test physical strength, agility, reflexes, even our mental powers. Each of those is a skill needed to organize matter throughout our life and playing this game develops these skills. And here's a game where you learn you always have an opportunity, but you don't always have an opportunity to win. And for the most part, as a game, it is very fun. But we can't have the fun, and we can't develop the skills, or know when we achieve a goal, except we build the physical structure with its physical structures, the physical system with its physical structures, any more than we can stop being hungry, except we eat. None of us alone can have the fun of a football game, except we have two teams even if we have the ball and the stripes and the whistles. Now I know many people who object to team sports because of this competition thing, because it teaches us to destroy each other and ruin each other's lives. That's not a part of the game. That's wholly resident in the league play, where awards having nothing to do with the game are arbitrarily assigned winners and losers get nothing and those rewards impact a person's social experience off the field. The reward of money, you see, is not the direct benefit of the activity on the field. The direct consequence of activity on the field is points. A system devised to measure accomplishment that results in no measurable productivity. That point system actually reflects the true and actual return on the activity on the field because there is no tangible benefit to be realized through these activities such as there is with, say, harvesting lumber, which results in being able to build houses and furniture and heat homes in winter. That activity is its own reward and the cooperators can divide the fruits of their labors, take in a portion of the lumber and do as they wish with it. Mutual cooperation, mutual benefit, mutual sharing of the outcome. But how do you divide up the physical results of a football game? Well, I think they're naturally award, awarded. There's a lot of satisfaction in that game for a lot of people, often whether they win or lose. And at the end of the day, if the losers of a ball game only get 15 points and the winners get 75 points, how much more ice cream or Rolls Royces can the winners buy with their points? There's nothing to divide but the mutual benefit of playing the game, and that's self-distributing. That big fat zero reflects the true economic value of their labor, but when the physics of the matter is considered. And any conversion of activity or points to money is an arbitrary assignment not reflective of physical reality. And the arbitrary assignment of tangible reward for a system that generates no tangible production always throws a social system out of directional equilibrium. It's just a fact. Believe that point. This is more important. You can't play the game without the creation of opposing forces. 
or teams. It makes the game much more interesting for all of us. If I try to pass the ball to you while someone else is trying to tackle me, at the same time someone else is trying to steal that ball out of the air before it falls in your hands. What if I have two choices who may receive my pass and two options to let someone run with it and now your team has to figure out how to defend all those possibilities at the same time. The fun exponentially increases. But we find there's a limit. Too many opportunities knocks the game out of equilibrium, so we set a limit to the number of players on the teams. The solution is not to refuse to generate forces. The solution is to create the system of the size that cancels out the forces it does generate to limit it all but the ones that drive the game to wherever we like it to go. That's why football players are outfitted in their equipment. That's why we have rules. We build structures to cancel out forces. So we need those two teams and to have those two teams we have to cooperate and make up rules about how each team and each team member may behave. And how do we get equal rules? Well, it turns out we're constrained to make fair rules by the simple swapping of roles. It's understood whatever opportunities, demands, and penalties we place on one team when they're on offense. We'll grant the exact same when the other team plays it Offense, no difference. That's equilibrium and equality and equal opportunity, but it does not result in equal outcomes. And the outcomes, if conditions are in equilibrium, are deemed fair. Notice how we keep trading places in this game. First we defend, then we advance. We don't give any team the option to hold the game, the ball for the whole, the duration of the game. We have an incredible amount of tools to ensure no team holds the ball. A team has four downs to move the ball 10 yards or kick it away. At the end of play, there's a clock that starts ticking. And if 40 seconds pass and the offense hasn't begun another play, they suffer a penalty. That penalty will stop the clock so the team cannot burn up the clock. If a team could figure out how to meticulously drive down the field, advancing 10 yards every four plays, and use a full 30 minutes before scoring, thereby preventing their opponent from scoring, it would be boring, but we would also admit someone was a genius. And then at some point, we would change the rules so it didn't become the game. Now we don't limit how much time a team may possess the ball during the game. We just create conditions that make certain the ball passes back and forth. We don't take away anybody's freedom. We let them give it up. There is a force of equilibrium creating equal opportunity, not equal outcomes. We don't throw all opportunity to success to one team. For every measure of success on one side, there's an equal measure of success on the other. The defender who knocks down a pass has succeeded. Every play is successful and success ripples throughout the field, showing up here, then there, and more than once in any play. The defender who doesn't have a chance to knock down a ball because he covered his man so well has succeeded, even if it pales in comparison to the success of another receiver who escaped his defender and caught a pass for a touchdown. Let's talk about the rules in general. The rules of the game are elegant. There are many, but they are all coherent. And they are universal, which is to say all rules are in play at all times. Whether or not a rule is applicable is dependent on conditions and circumstances on the field. However, the same rule applies under like conditions and circumstances at all times. Like conditions are established by physically identifiable traits. The quarterback has rules which apply only to him. 
but they also apply to every quarterback in every game in the common league. And if he switches roles and acts as a tackle, the rules applicable to tackles attached to him and those specific to quarterbacks do not. Okay. The penalties for violation of a rule are always the same. There's no arbitrary decision as to the penalty. Holding gets 10 yards, encroachment gets 5 yards. Pass interference moves the ball to the spot of the foul, automatic first down. The rules do not vacillate for the duration of the game. The rules the game starts with are the rules the game ends with. In a league, the rules played under in one game on the field are the rules played in one game on every other field across the duration of a season with them. Games have a finite period of time. And there are no advantages gleaned from one game carried into the next. Except that observable but unquantifiable characteristic called momentum. We don't carry our points, our field position, or anything. We start every game from the point of equilibrium, equal opportunity, and we measure successful that team that outperforms the other, uh, other under common conditions on exactly one thing that can be measured, the number of points scored. We could measure a bunch of things, but we use one thing to score the game. Again, those conditions actually mirror the nature of the laws of the that organize the universe. I'll leave it to you to consider how the nature of these rules differ from our unsuccessful social systems and those we are unable to drive in the direction we desire. Let's talk about penalties. First off, there is no intent behind whether or not a person is assessed a penalty. The penalty comes about as a, as a result of observing physical behavior, period. And the penalty is always one that makes it physically harder to accomplish one's objective under the rules. We don't like people, players throw cash at the referee and just keep going, taking advantage of what they achieve by their penalty. We actually reverse the momentum by setting the ball back and making the team work harder to achieve the objective. That, what we do, doesn't change the rules for either team at the next play. We don't modify the rules. So the penalties don't automatically bar success, but they do make it more difficult to succeed. Again, that is the way the universe works. There are no mandates to conform with the laws of flight. But if you don't, there isn't punishment needed. You just have to work harder under the same rules and conditions as always existed to accomplish your objective. And there's no guarantee of success. We begin in the game in equilibrium. And we have to step out of equilibrium to start the game. And we start the game with a flip of a coin. Mm -hmm. Somebody wins that flip, but nobody has control over that act. But the player who wins has a choice. So they're a force in control of the situation. So they make their choice as to whether they'll kick or receive. But now choice now switches to the loser of the flip, and they have a choice as to which end of the field they'll defend. On windy days, that could be a nice advantage to choose the goal which will give you the most opportunity to prevail over your opponent and gain some momentum. Of course, that advantage will be lost at the end of a quarter when the teams switch sides of the fields. No team can hold an unfair advantage by creating difficult conditions at one end of the home field and requiring the 
a way team to play under those conditions. We have all manners of ingenious systems in place to ensure equilibrium is ensured even if someone tries to disrupt equilibrium out of self-interest. Each snap of the ball on a foot football field unleashes all manner of ferocious activity. It typically lasts anywhere from 6 to 10 seconds. The activity can be canceled out almost immediately by the sound of a whistle. It's a pretty amazing feat of physics, don't you think? And there are approximately 120 plays to a game of professional football that is 120 instances of unleashing a dynamic system to go where it will and then bringing it to equilibrium only to fire it up again. Every rule is implemented and enforced by physical object. A score doesn't occur just when somebody decides a score has occurred but when a ball crosses a line on the ground. Out of bounds occurs if any part of the body touches the white line or crosses over it. Offsides is measured by any part of the defender's body crossing the line of scrimmage. False start is any movement by the offensive front line. The 10 yard increments are ensured to be the same for both teams at all times by the chain gang. The chain is the official 10 yard mark. If the chain is a length too long or a length too short, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, both teams play under common conditions. So here we have a system, rule heavy, with structures absolute. And there's no end to opportunity and creativity within the system. It doesn't wear out. By and large, the game itself treats all players equally. Now, we don't want to match 10-year-olds against 30-year-olds in this game, but when teams are f composed of physically similar players, both among and within teams, this game can be incredible amounts of fun. It achieves the objective for which it was built day in, day out, year in, year out, generation in, generation out. And it looks like the universe and it plays like the universe. And it all comes about because we employ the physical principle and our knowledge of equilibrium. I could go on, but I'll call it quits. I'll leave some for you to discover. The point is equilibrium is only achieved by building physical systems that ensure equilibrium. On Saturday at the college, a fashion a social system by setting the purpose as the inherent purposes of a government of for and by the people life liberty and the pursuit of happiness an equal opportunity for all and then I'll build physical structures that achieve those purposes continually I'll employ the physical laws of social organization the physics of equilibrium to drive that structure toward its object end no matter who plays the game. I'll just create systems that cancel out forces. It doesn't kill those forces, but cancels them out. It doesn't kill opportunity, but balances it out. Hope to see you there. Thank you very much for listening. <clears throat> Let's see if I did it. Mm -mm -mm.